Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, hello. Aha. Okay. Hello, and the I will see. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Hi. There's a lot of you. Oh, hello, Ash. Okay, I'm going out of order here. Oh, that's okay. All right. I'm gonna say I say. Oh, oh, and hello, Jay Lynn. All right. Um, awesome. So, hello, Sarah. Hello, Jay Lynn. Now I'm going in the chat. Um, good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, all smile. Oh, and there's Brianna. All right. Did I say Brianna? I meant Brianna. Oh, oh, oh someone just said hello. Who? Oh, Sarah. sorry. Yes. Oh, my bad. All yeah. right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, indeed. All right. Um, all right. Now, this is good. Yes. And good afternoon, David. And good afternoon, all smile. Oh, a lot of people coming in. And hello, Gianna. And I will never, the rest of my life, I will never, no, and I know that I did mean Gianna, not Brianna. And I do see Brianna. Um, and I will never, ever confuse their two names again as long as I live. I even forget them. I, that is a, now I've made that promise in front of a witness that doesn't even go to our school. Okay, Jamalet, hello, good afternoon. Sophia, good afternoon. Hello, Ashley, good afternoon. Diana, oh, there's a lot of people. There's a big class. Good afternoon, Jalen. Hi, Sarah. Oh, we covered that right there. Good afternoon, Stephen from 2D. Um, good afternoon, Samuel. Samuel C. Good afternoon, Brianna. We did that. All right. Good afternoon, Samuel A. Good afternoon, Nicholas. Okay. And there is Abdel. Good evening. Good after top of the after. Oh, he your box just moved. Oh, I never knew the boxes could move. Okay. Okay. Hello, all of you. Now I have to say hello to my oh and and top of the afternoon, yes, yes. Okay, give me a second, because of course my board died right before we started, and now I, I need to do a sign in again. Just give me one second, but we're gonna we're gonna get straight to it today. I have to repeat. Uh, yeah, okay, give me one second. Sorry, sorry. Okay, one more second. Oh, and that's okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. And is somebody here, someone just came in, no. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for saying so. Yes, good afternoon, Brooke, absolutely. And good afternoon, it's good to see you and good to see you in 2D, in, now I feel like I know you. Oh, come on, come on. Board, stay co-host, board, stay. Don't give up the... Oh, and Shakia, wait a minute. Sorry. Did I let Shakia in? Is Shakia... Uh, okay, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. So, um... Oh, and there's Nicholas in 3D, or I mean in two and a half D in video. That's awesome. Okay. And hello, Shakia, if you just came in, I think, because now I can't see everybody because the board is up. Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Good question in the private chat or in the direct chat. Um, right. Right. I, there's a little bit of a... Yes. So if you did, yes, 
um, how can I say this concisely? Right. So if you turn, we still have more time to get to more of homework two, uh, two, one and two. Um, but if you turned it in at all, if you turned in homework two at all on for when it was due today, you've you have gotten a lot of points already. But right, that is not a final grade. Um, you will still get more points, and honestly, even if right, there's still an opportunity to get more points on homework too. But also, and I did that quickly. Yeah, I'm trying to do things a little bit more quickly and with a little bit. Therefore, some feedback is getting sacrificed. I'm reading things quickly and not writing as much so I can get you numbers faster. But so if, so most of you who turned in homework too, if you made a valiant attempt and attempted it and got it in on time today, you got a lot of points already with the assumption that if you do more or if more gets corrected or more feedback comes, you'll definitely get even more points. There's no, no draft is final and no points are final, but if you feel like I looked at it too quickly, if you feel like you actually did do every single part and there isn't more for you to do, like you actually think that's like a final version and it's perfect and I missed that fact, you could definitely just send me a quick text and say, wait, I actually think you under, I think I did all of this. I don't think there is anything left for me to do. I think I am up ready for a perfect score. I mean, I, I may have made that mistake in a couple of places, so I'll definitely look at that. But in general, I'm saying, Right. People are still going to get a lot more points and hopefully more feedback and have more attempts to turn it in. Right. Every every draft you guys are turning it to me, I'm considering a starting draft until you like finish things. And every amount of points I'm giving to you, I'm considering like, here's points. You can still get more points. You can still get more points, but here's points already. So, you know, you only have a few points to go. But so hopefully that sort of answers the direct track question. Um, it's all the same ultimate grading system as last semester, but I'm I'm trying to triage a little bit more to get points to people faster. So I'm sacrificing a little bit of feedback, um, at least at this at this stage. So yes, if you, that is not a final score, and if it should be because you think that everything you did actually was final, and I misunderstood or underread, just text me and let me know. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, cool. Um, and and also again for any of you is to also to say that anybody that hasn't turned in homework two yet, or even homework one, you still could get all the points. It's just, I'm sort of just trying to make it more clear to everybody that like the faster you turn stuff in, the faster you get points. And then the faster you do updates or revisions or better drafts, the faster you get more points. So everybody can still get all the points, but I kind of want you to see as you're going that you're getting that gratification, if that, that okay? Um, but don't let anybody, don't take this, like one person, I think even texted, um, asked me officially today, can we get an extension on homework too? And I just put a thumbs up back. Cause like, I haven't put an extension in the date yet in the Google classroom, but like necessarily, yes, like you, the door is not closed on homework too. And we still have a lot more to talk about, about both of them. Okay. Last thing I'll say about all this. One thing I can tell you is you're not going to get homework three for a little while. I can certainly tell you that we have enough to talk about in homework one and homework two still. Okay. Um, specifically today. So I feel like there was one other. Thing. Oh, sorry. And one other announcement that only applies to this class. I mentioned this to some of you that I saw and that I had the pleasure and delight of seeing in person yesterday. Um, I'll try to remember to put this in Google Classroom. But next Monday, <clears throat> as you know, we don't have classes. Wait, today is Wednesday, right? Next Monday, we don't have classes. But then the day after that, Tuesday, is a Monday schedule. But at, then that's true at John Jay, but it can't be true for this class because this class for me would then conflict with something else that I do somewhere else that isn't on a, that's on a Tuesday schedule. So next Tuesday, and I will try to remind you of this, but next Tuesday, we will not meet as a group. I will post the video of the section that meets at noontime. Yes, next Tuesday, I will meet the other section at noontime. I will, I will video that and post that video. And that will count as your class for that day for the material and everything. But I should also say that if you want to join the other class at noon, 
you're absolutely welcome to do so. Yes. Why am I pausing? So yeah, so that's it. Um, okay. Let's. Okay. So this. So I want to. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna continue now. I mean, if there's questions, put them in the chat for sure. But I'm gonna continue now with the material that I was doing last class, last Wednesday, which again is in the context of homework 1B. We still have to finish going over homework 1B. It's in the context of 1B and it's in the context of questions four and five. Again, with questions four and five of homework 1B, you got the answers already. You got a skeleton solution already, but now I'm backing up and trying to discuss in more detail really the relationship between work as a physics concept, integrals as a mathematical concept, and energy as a physical concept. I'm ultimately trying to show where this idea of total mechanical energy conservation comes from. Total mechanical energy conservation is what we used to solve question four and five. I'm now trying to show really what that means in calculus terms. Okay, so the so so the two equations that just flashed away from work are what I'm going to try to get to today. Those look like equations that I've started to develop with you last Wednesday, but they look like, but they're a little bit different. They are the goal of today. The two. So that's why I'm not even going to. If you didn't catch them, I'm not even going back at. They're the goal. Where did we last leave off? This is where I believe we last left off. Okay. Okay, stop me if I'm wrong, but I believe the very last thing that we just established is that work, the physical concept of work, the work done on a system to move it from location X to location, excuse me, to, sorry, the work done on a system to move it from location x1 to location x2 is the path integral of the force exerted on that system from location x1 to location x2. Work is the path integral of force. Okay. Um, it's the continuous sum of dot products of force with little infinitesimal amounts of displacement. Assuming all of this assumes Assuming that force is some kind of continuous function of position or of displacement, if force depends on position, then the amount of work we do on a system to move it from position one to position two is the amount of force exerted, dotted with the amount of displacement we move it plus the amount of force we exert times the displacement we move it plus the amount of force we exert plus the infinitesimal amount we just we move it etc cetera, etc cetera. that's what work is i think that's the last thing we established 
Okay. Oh, uh, sorry. And we, so that's what work is. And what an integral is, triple equal sign, is a continuous sum of products. And the products are always the value of the dependent variable times a little bit of interval, an infinitesimal advancement in the independent variable. That's what an integral always is. So that's what work is. That's what an integral is. Then the other thing we established at the very end of last class, like all of that is saying, oh, if only we could continuously sum up all of the little dot products of force and displacement throughout some huge interval, then we would know what the work being done is through that interval. That's what we established. But then we said, oh, but none of this tells us how to calculate work. It doesn't even tell us that calculating work actually is necessarily possible. It just says, if we could calculate this continuous sum, this thing that we call an integral, then we would have the work. So then we said at the end of last class, oh, it, it, like given any of our knowledge of differentials and derivatives, infinitesimals, given any of our notation that we have, can we see any way to compute an integral at all? And what we found was the fundamental theorem of calculus. We found that even though what an integral is, by definition, is the continuous sum of products, we found that what it turns out to be equal to is the derivative run in reverse. Very big revelation. Very easy to get lost in the shuffle. The revelation is that if you want to calculate the integral, you can do a derivative backwards. It's so fundamental a theorem that we call it the fundamental theorem of calculus. But please note again, something I never tire of saying that it is a theorem, it is not a definition. The reason it doesn't sound interesting often to many of us, or at least me, the first 85 times I heard it was I thought it was self-evidently true. I thought, that integrals were antiderivatives the way I heard the class when I took it. I thought my first understanding of an integral was, oh, the backwards derivative. So then when they made this big deal <clears throat> that an integral can be done by doing a derivative backwards, I was like, well, isn't that what an integral is? Why is that even a big deal? Like, duh, the integral is the antiderivative. So of course, if you want to do it, you do it. But no, what the integral is, is a continuous sum of product. It turns out that to do it, you can do derivatives backwards. I didn't see that one. I mean, when you think of it that way, that's like a pleasant surprise. So let's, so we're going to now start using that piece of knowledge. We're going to say, oh, in fact, okay. So, so, so the piece of knowledge I just said is, Okay, so we have work is the integral, the path integral of force, and we have the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says the integral of a func, sorry, which says the integral of a derivative of a function is the original function itself. So, with those two things in mind.
Okay, so I'm gonna ask you now, I'm gonna ask everybody in the private chat, in the direct chat, yeah, in the direct chat, pause for a second and give me an answer to this question, if you can. I'm saying, a so there's a quick refresher on derivatives. Basically, I'm asking about the power rule. I'm asking to make sure that we sort of remember the power rule. So say you have a function, y equals a times x to the n, where n is a constant and a is a constant, but x is the independent variable and y is the dependent variable, right? So you have a function y equals a x to the n. What I want in the private chat, awesome, someone already did it. And I'm not gonna say whether they're right or wrong because I don't want to intimidate anybody, but they're totally right. And so far there's only one person. So if she or he um, did write in the direct chat, then they know that I'm talking to him or her. Oh, now there's a bunch of people. Okay, and this is in the direct chat, this is awesome. Just keep them coming. I'm not gonna say who I'll be, and you can totally submit this for participation. I'm totally thrilled. Just keep them coming, it's the private chat. It's a, <laughs> okay, no, the, um, no, this is awesome. Yes, so far, so, so far everybody, and I don't wanna intimidate anybody. Okay, so far a bunch of people have gone in direct chat. I'm not gonna take the time to respond to each one of them directly, but like yay person, yay person, yay if your name has an S in it, yay if your name has an A in it, yay if your name has an A, yay if your name has an S in it, yay if your name, okay, a lot of people in the direct, but keep them coming. And I will even say, oh, oh interesting, interesting. Oh, interesting. Oh, and quick, oh, and now I'm getting some varied answers. Keep them coming just as a refresher. And I'm gonna remind you now, what I'm really asking is the power rule. I'm I'm actually getting some things in there, in here, which look really impressive and look like people remember their product rule, which is impressive and really cool. I'm gonna tell you right now, you don't need the product rule for this. That's very clever. At least one of you did the product rule. To, and, and the person who did the product, at least one of you, if you did the product rule, I want you to be proud of yourself for remembering that and thinking of it. I want you to submit it in the participation and take this the right way, please. I want you to even also submit it for the extra points in the wrong answer portal. Because to be honest, you don't need, and you, you can't really use the product rule because there's only one variable here, X. Like it's not really a product of two functions. It's really one function because <clears throat> it's just a constant times X raised Good, good, good. Now some people are describing it in English in the direct chat. Cool. Awesome, awesome. I want to keep this going for a little bit more. Just want everybody to... oh, close, very close. Someone just put in, definitely people have the right idea. I am asking about the power rule, if that makes sense. And I think there's, you could say it in English if you want, or you you could say it with the symbols, but hold on. I'm just, I actually, I'm not going to respond to everybody, but just hold on. Awesome. Okay, I'm getting a lot of responses. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, I'm gonna. Okay, very good. A lot. Okay, so oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. I just got another one. Okay, this is great. And again, even those of you who, even those of you who made a slight mistake, <clears throat> you should still be very proud of yourself. And I'm totally glad that you're right there with me. And you should submit for the extra points. So I'm gonna. And you can keep coming if you want. So this is good. I think the class is with me. So I'm going to say what I what I think I if you wrote it in one, I think the answer is this. Something like that. Oh, something like something like something like hello, hello, where's it? Hello, I just wrote it. Come on, delay board. Whoa, wow, it's like in, okay, there we go, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's the answer. Like in other words, you lower, you, oh, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on. Okay, and I just got another answer, which is good. I think, 
So I'll explain. So some people don't remember the rule so well, so that's fine. That's fine. What I'm just saying, I'm saying that if you have a, if you have a algebraic function like this, if you have something multiplied by a coefficient and raised to a certain power, you multiply the whole thing by the power and you bring the power down by one. In other words, for example, if we had, if we had y equals five x to the fourth, we would multiply. We look at that exponent four, multiply the whole thing by four. So you get 20 X, but then we bring down the power four by one. That's what we do. Um, let me know if that's really four. And you know, we might even, it's it's pretty easy to prove. It's, pre, it's pretty straightforward and logical to explain why that's true. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna do that right now. I might go back and explain. But it comes from the definition of the derivative. Um, um, but okay, and, and if you have any issues with that, you please do text or email me. We could talk about it more slowly. But in general, when you have a function like that, multiplied by a coefficient raised to a power, you lower the power by one and you multiply the whole thing. Sorry, you multiply the whole thing by the power and then you lower the power by one. That's a rule that always works for a function like that. Um, um, and, and here's where we're going to use it today. So again, if you have issues with that, I totally understand, but please text or email me because I am going to, I'm going to assume from here on that it seems like most of you have some familiarity or, or memory of that. So I'm going to go on and I'm going to use it here to do this example. Now that we've established that work is an integral and we've established the fundamental theorem of calculus, that the integral of the derivative of a function is the original function i.e. that integrals are doing derivatives backwards, then I'm going to say, Okay. Okay, so let's finally apply this to the physics that we're talking about right now. Let's say we have a spring of stiffness K and there's a mass on the edge of it. And the mass is held out at initial displacement from equilibrium x naught, initial position x naught. And we let it go. So our problem here, homework 1b, we let it go. And the spring now exerts a force on it to bring the mass back to equilibrium position x equals zero. We want to know the total work done by the spring as it's bringing the mass in to the equilibrium position. Um, Well, work is in effect force times displacement, right? But if we hadn't, I mean, work is force dotted with displacement. The dot product part itself is about vectors and angles and cosines and all that. We, that turns out to be a, not a big issue here with the mass on the spring because the spring force will pull, let's say to the left and the mass will displace fully to the left both the force and the displacement are on the same axis. The angle between the two vectors is zero. The cosine is one. So we don't have to get too worried about the dot product aspect. Those numbers will just multiply.
Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, hold on a second. Um, um, sorry, that's distracting. Um, um, but what we so we don't have to worry about the dot product part. But what we do have to worry about is the fact that if we just multiply, this is a perfect example where the integrals and the calculus come into play. Because if we pull this mass all the way out to say, to, to X naught, to say 15 centimeters from equilibrium, and say the K of this mass is 200 newtons per meter, as it is for our homework problem, we pull the mass all the way out to position 15 centimeters. Work is force times displacement. But if we're naive, if we don't take into account this whole idea that the force is a continuous function of displacement, we might easily think, well, the force is kx. Okay, k is 200, x is 0.15. So we might think the force is kx, 200 times 0.15. In other words, um, uh, negative, in other words, 30 newtons. And we might think the displacement is 15 centimeters. So we might say, okay, force is 30, displacement is 0.15, multiply them together, that's our work. But the problem with that is that the force is only 200 times 0.15 when the mass is sitting there at the edge at 0.15. The moment the mass comes into 0.14, the force is something smaller. And the minute it comes into 0.13, the force is smaller still, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if we just did force times displacement and we use we wouldn't know what force to use. If we use that one all the way at the edge, that's a vast overestimation of how much force is gonna be exerted and therefore how much work is gonna be done through it the whole interval. And if we use the force at the end, the force at the end is zero, that's gonna be a vast underestimate of what's going on. So we have to add up all the little bit of force displacement, force displacement, force displacement products. We have to do the integral to do this. So this is good practice, right? So the work done by the spring on the mass will be the integral from the position it starts at, x naught, to zero, right? The mass is going to go from x naught to zero. So we want the work done on that mass by the spring, spring force. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We want by the by the force of the spring dotted with the displacement. So let's do this carefully, right? We're going to use the definition. So it's the work done from x naught to zero of the dot product of force times displacement. Okay, the dot product means f dx cosine of the angle between them, right? That's what we learned last week. But now in this case, when the force is like that and the displacement is like that, both the force and the displacement are both purely horizontal, both pointing toward the center. So the angle is zero. Right, so so the cosine of zero is one. Okay, so that gets rid of the vector symbols, right? That that what I just did was I just dealt with the dot product. So now I don't have to have to, the dots anymore. Now, what? Is, so now I have to plug in. What is the force? The force is negative kx because it's a spring. So I'm doing this, all right? So now, before I go any further, well, yeah, okay. Um, so now you tell me, based on the power rule, we, we just said, according to the power rule, that when you take the derivative of a function expressed in that way, to take a derivative, you take the whole function, multiply it by the power, and then lower the power by one. We're integrating here. So we wanna go backwards. We wanna find the function which, for which, when we differentiate it, we get this one. So could somebody tell me what fun, using the power rule backwards, 
what function do we need such that when we multiply it by its own power and then lower its power by one, we get negative kx. Like, what is the antiderivative of? Ne could someone put in? You could put in the direct chat or the regular chat. I want what is the antiderivative of negative kx? So what I'm waiting for is I'm waiting for the antiderivative of negative kx dx. Like what function, when you differentiate it, gets you negative kx? Yeah, oh, oh, awesome. And that's in the direct chat. Awesome. Now we're talking. I see two. Great. That's all. I, both two things in the direct chat, which I appreciate. And they're both totally right. So if you put something in the chat, so far, you are right. That is awesome. And I'm going to, sorry, I'm being distracted by something. As you can tell, this is totally bad for me. Okay. Can I get one more in the direct chat? And then on the, ah, close. Okay. Getting there. Okay, hold on a second. I see. Oh, oh, I'm getting some interesting answers in the direct chat now. Okay, okay. Okay, hang on one second. I'm even going to respond. Good. Great. The person who just, I'm getting great response in the direct tap. Some of them are interesting questions. Some of them are slight. So give me one second. Keep coming. If you're doing this, do it in the direct chat. It's great for all of us. Um, like, and I'll even give a hint again, but this is great. I'm getting... Okay, great, great, great. Okay, that's enough. So again, and please, those of you who are putting these things in, there's a lot of just these, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of portals. You can put these things in, like you can triple dip these things into a lot of portals for a lot of points. The mere fact that you're, that, Good. Another one just came in. That's correct. And again, please understand it. If whether you're correct or incorrect, there's a portal. Literally, it's called for right or for wrong. The fact that you're putting an answer here at all, I just cannot be uh, reward you enough and encourage you enough. The fact that you guys are putting answers here at all, there's a portal for that. And those of you who are actually getting wrong answers, there's an extra portal for that. Like, don't let that discourage you from doing this. Um, so, and this, so, so this is great. So now what I'm going to say, because there are a lot of things I'm seeing in the direct chat and they're showing me, you've got to understand that they're making the class better when you do this. They're helping me teach you for me seeing what you actually like are clear with and what you're not. So I'm going to say this, what's happening is, yeah, so I'm asking for the antiderivative, the backwards derivative, of the integral of negative kx. And I'm saying negative kx is like a function, like we just did. It's like ax to the n, only the a is negative k, so to speak. Like the coefficient is negative k, the power is one. So, and I'm saying let's do it backwards. So before what we, we did was we multiplied the whole thing by the power and, and then we lowered the power by one. So we literally want to do that backwards now. So that means literally backwards. So not that we're going to invert each operation and we're going to reverse the sequence, if that makes sense. So we're going to first, instead of before where we multiplied and then we dropped the power down, here we're going to raise the power up and then divide, right? So the power is one. So we're going to raise it to a power of two and we're going to divide the whole thing by two. And then the whole thing that includes the negative K. So the correct answer here that I'm, well, I'll write it down. So I do believe that the correct answer is, oops, sorry. No, that's not the correct answer. So I do believe the correct answer is this negative K X to the two all over two. Now evaluated 
from x naught to zero. And I want to talk about that for a second. Oh, wait, I just got another today. Oh, no. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, let me just be clear for a second. The mere fact that I just changed the smooth integral sign, the fact that I've gotten rid of the smooth sum sign and gotten rid of the dx means in this moment, I've done the integral. I, I've, I've performed the integration. Now, I, so the dx goes away and the smooth thing goes away. Like the, the, but, but then there's this bracket that ends up, which we talked a little bit about, about um, on last Wednesday. There's this bracket of x naught to zero. Notice it's a bracket. It's not the smooth sum sign anymore. And there's no dx anymore. There's a bracket. What just happened? Here's what happened. I, and I know, obviously, many of you know this, but bear with me. A function is a black box. You put, it's a rule. You put a number in, you get a number out, right? That's what a function is. Put a number in, you get a different number out, or maybe even the same number. But you put a number in, you get a number out. That's what a function is. An operation such as differentiate or integrate, an operation is something where you put a function in and get a function out. Let's be clear on that for a second. Function is something you do to numbers. A function takes in a number and spits out a number. An operation, like take the derivative or integrate, an operation takes in a function and spits out a function. It doesn't take in a number and it doesn't spit out a number. So when we say, what is the derivative, excuse me, when we say, what is the integral of negative kx dx, the derivative that, that's a function. We're asking you to integrate the function negative kx. The answer is some kind of function. In this case, negative kx squared over two, right? That's not a number. That's a function. If you're looking for a number, which we are, then we're going to have to plug a number into that function to get out a different number, right? So first of all, the function that we get is negative kx squared over two. When we different, when we anti-differentiated uh, negative kx. But second of all, now I say, but we want a number. So we're going to do something with this bracket thing here. How do I know we want a number? Because the original integral was a definite integral. The, and the original integral was not indefinite. It was definite. It specified. It said, we want to know the work done from this particular location called x naught to this particular location called zero. And I'm saying x naught and zero are numbers. I mean, granted, x naught looks like a letter. It's a letter that stands for a number though. What? And then you're like, well, what the heck? I mean, all letters stands for numbers. But I'm saying it stands for a specific number, a constant number. It's x naught is not a variable. Right? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Portal for that. There is a portal for that. It's called backup, please. So yeah, uh, um, oh, so the original question, well, the original, original question, sorry, someone's asking, this is the original, original, uh, okay, okay. Um, I'm gonna pause there for, well, so tell me if this is. So, so what I'm saying is, we wanted to know the work done by a spring on a mass, to bring the mass from this particular place called x naught to this other particular place called equilibrium. Now, let me be really clear again, because this is where physics starts getting maybe a little abstract. I'm calling, I'm saying x naught is a specific place. You might think, well, that's not very specific, x naught. I mean, if you had said a number, a real number like 15, I'd be with you, Yaverbaum, but you're saying x naught is a specific place. And I'm saying, yes, it is, because it's not x, it's x naught. I'm saying there's a specific place that is that is given in the problem. Now, because I want to be a little bit general and I want this to apply to any lab setup, I don't care literally whether it's 15 centimeters or 14 centimeters or 13, but I do care that it be a particular location that's not going to change throughout the whole. It's like where you place the mass. And we want to know how much work is being done to bring the mass from this given known, like another way of putting it is a given location. It's a known location. Even if right now I'm calling it X naught so that I can talk to all different lab groups that might have all different given locations. The point is it's still given as X naught, right? 
And I want to know how much work is being done from X naught to the given known place of zero, i.e. equilibrium. I want to know the work done from this particular place to this other particular place. So first of all, this is a definite integral. So there were some people that in the direct chat said things about plus C, very clever very wise, clear, and I'm not being sarcastic. If you said something about plus C, you are a good person and a good student, and you have been paying attention in your calculus class and all that, like really. And some, and when plus C does matter, it really matters. And we really have to be like observant about it. But this is not one of those times. Plus C comes in when you have a indefinite integral where you haven't even specified what you're talking about you're just talking about the function in general so then the plus c comes up to say like oh and by the way since we don't really know where you're talking about we have to cover ourselves and say like there might be a little bit extra like we don't know if you're going from here to there or there to there so the plus c covers that but here we're saying specifically from x naught to zero okay which means at the end of the day, we're going to want an answer. We don't just want a function. We want the value of that function within this interval. Now, the value is going to be, in effect, a number. It might have an X naught in the answer rather than the actual number 15 or something. But I'm, what I'm really trying to emphasize here, that is very actually like 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 hard for people and new in a way until it isn't, is I'm saying everything in math and physics eventually looks like a bunch of letters. Really, all the numbers, go, even though math we think of as like about numbers, it's not. Eventually, the numbers go away because in math and physics at this stage, because we're trying to write down relationships that we think would be true no matter what your particular measurements happen to be, right? But, but, there, but some letters are variables and some letters are constants, and we really want to keep that straight. And in fact, there's two different kinds of variable, independent and dependent. And it turns out there's different types of constants, which we're going to want to keep straight, such as configurations and parameters or something. So, so what I'm saying is we asked a definite integral question. We asked, what is the work done from here to there? So our ultimate answer is we are ultimately going to want not just a general function, but we're going to want to evaluate that function. We're going to want to plug in a number or numbers into that function to get out a number or numbers, even if our numbers look like letters. And whenever you evaluate an integral, okay, it looks like this. It, to evaluate an integral means to plug in the two endpoints of that integral, and there always will be two endpoints in a one-dimensional definite integral. You're putting in the initial value, well, you're putting in the final value, and the initial value plugging into the function and subtracting their difference. Because what you're really saying is like, what is the function doing from here to there? And the answer to that is, well, it's whatever the function did there minus whatever the function did here. And you might say, why minus? Where's the minus coming from? And why are you doing it backwards? Because if I ever asked you, how much did you grow from January to now, like in height, if I just said, oh my God, you've grown so much since I last saw you in 3D in January, you've grown so much. How much have you grown since January? You would say, well, it's my height now minus my height in January, right? That's what, right? And that's what we're doing here. We're saying, how much has the function accumulated from here to there? Well, it's whatever the value of the function is there minus whatever the value of the function is here. So what we always, so we got, we anti-differentiated which got, which means we performed the integral. We got rid of the integral sign. We got rid of the DX. Now we've got our new function, like a function that we're going to evaluate from one point to the other. We're doing all this because it's a definite integral. So to evaluate, we literally go like this. I know you know this. I'm just trying to put this in. Now that you've done it a million times in math, I'm kind of just trying to back up and show you what you've been doing. So maybe it hangs together, makes a little bit more sense, maybe, and connects to physics, maybe. Like, again, I'm not trying to condescend to, I know, I can tell by your answers that many of you in the room have done this a million times. I can also tell by your answers that some of you are fuzzy on it. What I'm saying is I also did it a million times before I had any clue what it actually meant. Maybe this is now, what you get my point. So we plug in, I plug in zero for the X, and I subtract from that
x naught for the x, right? And I'm going to subtract. Now this looks really ugly, but all I'm doing is plugging in and, 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 and subtracting. But now notice, notice something that you also have learned in math. I just want to, like, we're subtracting. And, and a negative times a negative is a positive, right? So you notice whenever you subtract, a, when you subtract a negative, it's really like adding a positive. So really, I could simplify this a little and say it's really I just want you to notice something that I know you all know. You notice that once I simplify it, I'm just doing out the math here, but you notice like I have a negative sign on the whole thing, but then I have to subtract. So a negative times a negative is a positive. So it's as though, so it's as though I just subtracted in the opposite order. And I could have just done that from the start. This is why you have this rule that you always do in calculus. If you want to get rid of the negative sign in some integral, you can, if you want to multiply by negative one, on some integral, you can just flip the limits of integration. That's not arbitrary. It makes sense because the limits are just telling you to do a subtraction problem. And this is what always happens when you multiply any subtraction problem by negative one, okay? So at the end of the day, and of course, one of these two terms happens to be zero. So at the end of the day, one of the two terms goes away. So at the end of the day, I'm saying, Okay, now I'm looking at the time. Okay, that's a mem that's a takeaway right there. You can memorize that if you want. That's not really my point, but you certainly can. Like, what have we do? We have not just found that work is always one half kx squared. We have, oh, oh, excuse me, excuse me. There we go, okay. What we have just found is that the work done by a spring to bring a mass from x naught to zero is one half kx naught squared. The work done to bring from any value x to zero would be one half kx squared. Like we can generalize this now. The work done by a spring to go from any one value x to zero would be one half kx squared. That's the work done by a spring. Okay, that's good. That's an important result. Like you can memorize whenever we're talking about the work done by a spring, that's always going to be the answer now because we just did the integral once and for all. But so what? Still, uh, and we have 20 minutes left. All of what I'm talking, so, okay. So we've done our first integral first. Well, that's nice. We've made our first application of our first, we've solved an integral to get the work done by a particular force, one that happens to be a continuous function of position. So it actually forced us to really think about differential changes. And we got it. The work done by a spring to move a mass from position X to position zero is one half KX squared. That's very nice. But what it doesn't tell us is, so what? It doesn't tell us what's the meaning or the consequence of this work. It in effect tells us the triple equal sign for this work, but it doesn't tell us the double equal sign. So let's go to this question, what is the consequence of work? So I'm gonna do, okay, so bank that in your mind somewhere. Again, you 
that just a fact what we just got. But now I want to see why it matters. And, and I want to relate it still back to where we got our information for questions four and five on homework one. So Okay, so I'm trying to see now what the point of work is. Like, why do I care? How does this, and really secretly, I'm trying to see where did I get all this 1F MV squared, 1FK stuff that we used in question four and five. In order to see that, I'm going to go back to the elemental case, the basic building block case of work from which we built all these work ideas. So let's go to a small amount of work over a small amount of displacement, small enough that F is, uh, is constant. Right, we're going to look at a case where F is constant. Um, and let's take it again, building block case. So let's assume that F is constant and let's assume that F is, is um, uh, parallel to X. Right, we're just, so we can look at the simplest case first and then build from there. Okay, now be careful for a minute. I'm about to use the symbols. Um, 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 I'm about to use the symbol. Why does focus not work? I thought focus is supposed to mean do not disturb. Someone's got to explain this to me. So like, okay, anyway, I know it doesn't work on my son, but I thought it was supposed to work on my devices. Okay, um, maybe it does work on the devices, but it doesn't work on ADHD. Is that possible? Okay, anyway, um, light bulb. Um, um, I'm about to use that symbol sigma again, but please be advised or be aware. I'm using simple, sigma always means sum. I'm using it right now in the old traditional sense of sum of all the forces, like net force. I'm not going to get into, I don't mean it to get all into summing things up, but what I'm saying is this. If we take the simple case of like a force pushing or pulling on a mass for, you know, parallel kind of way for a small constant force kind of way, then even if we had a bunch of forces doing that on some mass, the sum of all the forces, the net force, right, would, would lead us, if we looked at a bunch of forces acting on a mass, we could ask ourselves, what's the net effect of all of these forces? If, the, if a bunch of forces were doing work on a mass, we might want to ask ourselves, what's the net effect? What's the net work? done on this mass, what effect is that having on the mass? So I'm reminding us that net F equals MA, the sum of all the forces acting on something equals the mass times the acceleration of that thing. So the net work done by a bunch of forces, simple forces on a mass would be MA times delta X. So I'll just write that again. So but
if we're assuming the simple case where force is constant and and um and um, acceleration is constant, then our good old constant acceleration equations from the beginning of physics 203 apply. Like, like x equals one fat squared plus v naught t, like, like, and like the one that's the most obscure out of all of them, the one that we derived by just taking together our fundamental definitions and algebraically putting them together, we had one equation that was a little bit more obscure, but we specifically derived it for cases where we didn't know anything about the time and we weren't solving for anything about the time. We had this one relation that related just speeds, instantaneous speeds to acceleration and displacement. Precisely the situation that we have here when we're talking about like a mass moving on a spring, remember the whole original thing we said was like, we're looking for situation, we're looking for relationships. We're, we're talking about a situation where we know the instantaneous speed over here at this position in space. And we wanna know the instantaneous speed over here in this position in space. We have like a speed space relation and time doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. Or put another way, we're looking at forces acting throughout space. We're not looking at time. So that good old one dimension. So if you're wondering, where did I just pull this equation out of a, a bucket? I pulled this old equation out because it's a, it's a constant acceleration equation that makes no reference to time at all. It's precisely the kind that we would want to consider here if we, had, if we could. So we will. So I'm going to say plug this in. So basically, this is an equation that's on the first sheet of your first exam from last semester. Okay. I mean, you could, um, I think. Um, so we plug in. So I'm going to say right. So I just plug that in for A. But now the delta. I plugged it in for A, but now the delta X is, and, and by the way, in last semester or in that old context, we wouldn't have written it as delta X. We would have just written it by as X, but it means the same thing. It means a X2 minus X1, a displacement in X. I'm just using the deltas here to emphasize now that they are finite displacements, but okay. So, but it means the same thing. So the delta X is cancel and we see that the network done Okay, very quickly, this is what I'm saying. Now I'll explain. First of all, I'm saying, so in this small case where the force, where the displacement is small enough that the force is constant, in that small case, evidently when you do network on a system, the network that you do equals the difference for that system of its one half mv squareds, whatever that means. It means when you do network, 
If you do a small amount, a small but finite amount of network on a system, you will change the value of its one half mass speed squared from some old value to some new value. And the amount that you change it by, the amount, the difference in this package of values, one F MV naught squared old to one F MV squared new, the, the difference in that package of values is precisely the amount of work network that you do on this system over a small interval. Now, I'm gonna talk about that a lot. I mean, we have eight minutes, but one before I go any further, I wanna say that was all assuming a small case of work, a small case of displacement. But remember the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. So if we wanna to go, to, go to the limit and add up a bunch of all, if, if we're saying that's true for a little bit of displacement, and then we ask what's true for a big amount of displacement where we add up all these little, where we go to the limit and add up a whole bunch of little infinitesimal products of F times DX. Well, if we go to the limit as Delta X approaches zero, there's no Delta X's at all on the right side of this equation. So if we go to the limit as Delta X approaches zero, that's not gonna change the right side at all. In other words, in English, what I'm saying is we just established something for a little bit of work, but the fact is whatever we just established for this little building block brick, I, is totally going to apply. Now, if you take a bunch of bricks together and make a whole big brick, ha to, forget the metaphor, this is all going to apply to an infinitesimal little bit of displacement. But if you add up a whole bunch of infinitesimal little displacements to make one big displacement, this reality that you just found does not go away. It just extends to the whole because there's no delta x's on the right side to, to make that limit interesting. So I'm saying as what we just proved by looking at a special case, applies to the general larger case. And what is it that we just, we didn't prove, what we just discovered is that What we're saying is this, if we're asking ourselves, what happens when you do work on something, when you do net work on a system? Well, what will you change something about it? You give something to it. Do you give it velocity? Well, yeah, you probably give it velocity, but do you give it in an exact way? Like if you do three joules of work on something, do you give it three? If you do three joules of positive work on a system, do you give it three? units of velocity well no you don't the velocity is not even measured in the same units as 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 work is right but you do give it something you what do you what do you give it what you give it is half mass speed squared what what do i mean i mean this algebra is telling me that if i looked at a system like i look at the mass on the spring before it got pulled in by the spring i take the mass i look at its and I look at its mass, I take its mass as three kilograms and I divide that by two and I put that number in a bag, 1.5 kilograms. Then I look at its speed and its speed happens to be zero before the spring pulls it in. I, I take that speed and I square it. Zero squared is zero. I multiply that by what's already in the bag. So I take zero and I multiply it by 1.5 kilograms. I get zero. This number zero is not its speed, it's not its mass, it's its speed squared times half of its mass, a completely obscure combination of measurements that I never would have thought to care about before, I would have never thought to track before, but I do notice when I multiply all those measurements together, half of the mass times the square of the speed, I notice that what I'm doing is taking kilograms and multiplying them by meters squared per second squared. I put all that in my bag, then I push the thing with a with a force, with, I push the whole thing with a number of joules, let's say 15 joules of work, right? I push it through a displacement of 15 joules of work. What is a joule? It's a Newton of force 
times a meter of displacement. What is a Newton? A Newton is a kilogram of mass times a meter per second squared of acceleration, right? So I pushed this whole thing. I did work on it with say 15 joules, which are really kilograms times meter times meter per second squared. And I, and when the thing is done, I then decide just because of this algebra, I never would have thought to do this before, but because of what this algebra is saying, when the thing is done, I measure its mass again. Okay, it's still three kilograms. I divide by two, that's still 1.5 kilograms. Put that in my bag. And then I look at its speed now. Now its speed is like 3.78 meters per second. I take that speed, I square it. I put that in the, I multiply it by what's in the bag. So I take its speed now squared, multiply by its mass squared. And I look at that new number. And I compare how much, and the old number was zero. The old number of mass of a kilo of, of, of half mass speed squared. The old number was zero. The new number, I look and it's like 15. And the units are joules. And I realize, oh my God, 15 joules was the exact amount of work that I did on this thing. When you do positive work on something in joules, you change its half mass speed squared combination by precisely that number of joules, right? So this half, so I'm not saying I would have ever cared about half mass speed squared, but the algebra is telling me to notice that's the combination of characteristics of measurements that get changed by precisely the amount of work that you do on the system as measured in joules. So we call that whole thing kinetic energy, that package. And we say that from now on, and we'll stop here, work is the transfer of energy. And what is energy? Energy is the ability to do work. What I'm saying is, and I know I have one minute, I have one, one minute and a half, I'm saying this sounds like a circle and it sort of is, but it's a productive circle. Energy is the ability to do work. I'm saying energy is like money. Money is the ability to perform a transaction. What is a transaction? The transfer of money. What, like, why do I want money? Because if I have a lot of money, I have the ability to spend my money and get something in return, right? The more money I have, the more I can spend. Well, I spend it in an act known as an economic transaction, a, a purchase or a sale or something, right? Same thing here. When you do work in physics, when you exert a force through a displacement, when you do work, what you do is transfer energy from one system to another system. If you do positive work on another system, you give energy to that system that came from you. What is energy? It's your ability to do that. The faster you're moving, the bigger you are, the more you can bash into other things and get them moving. The more energy you have, the more work you can do. When you do work, you give over your energy to something else. All of it would be a completely pointless circle, except that we can transfer types of energy that we have a lot of into other types that we need. Just like with money, I can transfer dollars into Pokemon cards or whatever, right? So work is the transaction. Energy is the commodity. What And energy is the ability to perform that transaction. We'll just stop there for now because it's 1.30. If you have any questions, hang out for a second. Other than that, I, and just keep going with wherever you are on the homework and you'll just keep getting more points and we'll just keep going. But there's no new homework assigned and I will see you on Tuesday. I'll see you on tape on Tuesday and then I'll see you Wednesday. Right, okay. Um, but I'm done. If you, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good day, Professor. Oh, thank you, Nicholas. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. And I'm stopping the recording. Have a great day, Professor. Have a great day. Thank you, Amy. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Oh, great. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Okay.